I'm Paul Wilkinson and we're filming from Kathmandu where I'm introducing a number of uh, shamanic ritual objects and making a TV series on shamanism in the Himalayas. Um, this is a dengaru. It's a traditional shamanic drum with a ferber handle. So a ferber is like a sort of magic wand that the shaman use for healing and for directing energy. And these, these drums are two-sided with um, usually the skin of a male and a female animal um, and there's like a male side for the drum, a female side for the drum and the ferber is like a, um, a magic, magic wand used for directing energy so this is also part of the healing process um, so they sometimes will direct this ferber some, to the, the person being healed, so it's maybe putting them on the back or, and, then, and then drumming into the, drumming the vibration in. Sometimes they'll dig this into the ground so the energy is drawing from the ground into the, into the drum or releasing from the drum into the ground. The shame think of the Dengaru as their spiritual vehicle. It's like a, a horse that they travel from one world to another. And you sometimes get the same sort of um, symbolism on the fervor, where the shaman's riding his spirit horse from one world to another. And um, sometimes other sorts of spiritual spirit animals as well, like uh, tigers, for instance, uh, are often depicted with shaman riding on them. But the drum, the drum and the horse are almost interchangeable in the way that the, the shaman describes the drum. So sometimes they'll use the same word and they'll be talking about riding, riding from one world to another. But actually they're talking about the drum, they're talking about spirit riding rather than on a, on a physical horse. So these drums are made up of 13 elements, they call the 13 brothers, and the, the shaman playing the drum is actually the 13th brother. So there are 12 elements within the drum. And um, so before they do anything, the drums are always, they're, they're always kept on their side, like that. They're never face down. They, they think that's very disrespectful to, to, to sack them like that. So they're stored on their side, or they're hung up in the roof space, often above the fire, or in the, the area above the shaman. Um, so when you go into shaman's ho homes in the Himalayas, the drums are always hanging like that. And when they're using the drums, they're, they're on their side like that, they're never face down. And that probably has some practical reasons as well, because you, you don't want the, the skin to get wet and you don't want it to get damaged, so it's, it's obviously much safer to keep it on its edge. So when the, um, when the shaman is waking up the drum, they sometimes have special mantras that they're using for doing that, but they can, Part of the drum is resonant. And the drums themselves have objects inside as well. So they tap each of the elements of the drum to, to wake it up, and this also is another element. So you've got the fervor handle. Sometimes with um, ribbons around here, coloured cloths, representing the rainbow. Then you've got this special binding, which is usually made out of a type of bamboo. And inside, the, the drum handle has a long piece like that with a hole in it. So you've got a, usually the frames are made of, um, of walnut, and that's been split down um, along the grain and then heated and bent round and uh, let's see. and you can usually see the overlap somewhere up oh, here where it's, it's rolled it all the way around and they've then pegged it pegged it together and then you've got this is a, a, a type of bamboo which has been split 
and um, sometimes they use rattan, which is like a very, very strong type of vine. Um, and then inside, you can hear the pieces rattling around. Some, sometimes they're a little louder than, than that. They have usually three elements inside, and that's like the sort of heart of the drum. So they usually have a piece of uh, um, rock crystal, so something like a little piece of quartz or something like that. Sometimes stones from sacred sites, so when the shaman's been on pilgrimage and they found some stone that has particular power. Um, sometimes they have a little amulet inside and they usually have a piece of copper, um, sometimes silver but usually copper and the, that's often a, a, um, like a small copper coin or a piece of copper that's, that's, um, that the shaman has found and that represents the blood of Shiva so it's, it has a sort of elemental element to it and then this is this is a traditional shaman uh, stick in the shape of a snake, so in the shape of an, a naga. And this is also very ergonomic. You can see the way it wraps around the drum. So the shaman usually play from this, this side, away from them, and um, that means that the, the sound vibration is actually coming through the shaman while they're playing. So they're playing from that side. So when they're uh, when they're waking the drum up, they play both sides, they tap the, the banking binding, they tap the, the frame, they tap the bindings on the edge, they tap the handle, the, the fervor, they tap these bindings here, and then they shake, they shake around to wake the drum up. And then the, 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 the rhythmical aspect of playing um, is generally repetitive, so it's designed to create um, trance states, sort of altered states, so that the, the shaman can travel and journey with it. And the, the simplest rhythm that they do is a sort of... has a very, um, it's very sort of repetitive and rhythmical. When you've got a group of shaman playing together, it's almost like a train going off. It's and it gets faster and faster sometimes. And then the shaman are usually wearing two groups of bells going across and they're mala. So as they're shaking like this, the, the bells are going as well. Um, I do something where I quite often use a bell chain wrapped around my wrist. Um, I've just found that you can get other things with that. It, that's not a traditional way to use the bells, but I found that also very effective. And I'll make another video with, with that. So, the, the shaman look after the drums. with a, they, have, they pay them an enormous amount of care and respect. So, there's a few things here in terms of practice that you can you can do as well. So the skins of the drums, because it's closed, they're generally pretty good in um, even in fairly damp weather. Um, when I'm playing outside, I do a few. Uh, so you you generally want to try and keep it dry in English weather. That's very difficult. It's because <laughs> England rains so much. Um, I find that. Um, there's a few practical things I do. It, you can play them, they get, they get slightly deeper if, if playing in the, in the rain. Um, I dry them off afterwards. Um, you, if, you're, if you're going to be outside for many, many hours, um, this is a little practical tip, I take a camping stove and a small frying pan with me 
and I, I have the frying pan on top of the camping stove and I hold the drum a few inches above the frying pan and that will dry it out if you really if it gets really really wet um, but mostly you don't you don't need to do that so a few other things so you can hear that when the drums near to the near to your face you you can amplify your voice with the drum and that's very very good for for trance so when you're when you're playing you've got the vibration of the drum actually going into the body and again that really builds your your energy as you're playing and then there are some less conventional things which I find very very useful in my own practice so I'm going to pass them on a little bit so every part of the drum is resonant and if you if you play all the way around you can you can hear that you get these See this. This is probably a hundred or so years old, maybe older than that. Um, it's in very, very good condition. You can see the shaman have painted with with uh, probably mud on this case, but they 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 paint mantra and uh, sometimes yantra, uh, trishal designs, suns and moons, and this area they quite often stuff. Uh, flowers and sacred herbs around the outside. Um, so the ongoing process of this being a sort of living, living object is, is, is very, very interactive. So they'll even do things like divination with this. So they'll throw uh, rice onto the surface and then drum from underneath. Rice particles will jump, and then they, over t over time, they form into little groups, and then they count off the numbers, and they can. So they're asking a question, a little bit like other forms of divination, like uh, like the I Ching, for instance, where you're thinking of the question and you throw in your yarrow sticks or your your um, your your three coins, and then you count them off. So they have a number of forms of divination like that where they're telling the future and asking questions and they're using the drum to, to help determine the, the future. Um, looking after it, um, one of the, the shaman regularly give offering, offerings to the drums and they give incense and um, quite often they, they'll feed the surface of the drum with a boiled egg. I think that also has a practical uh, purpose because the protein of the egg is, is getting rubbed into the, um, into the surface of the drum. And I, I think that, that probably is like tonifying the leather, looking after the, the leather so it doesn't dry out too much. Um, but so they're, they're physically feeding, feeding the drum. It's like the void running all the way through the handle, through the tip. So you've got this thing of the fullness of the form and the emptiness existing in the same, in the same dimension. Um, I'll show you a few other drums, just so you can see that it's, this pattern is both repeated but with, with other variations. So this is very, very beautiful, with the Naga coming up, with the Sun, and... Um, you see the wider naga and the naga snake, the snake gods, crossing over one, two, three, four, five, seven times, so for the seven chakras, and opening up here with the moon at the crown, and again with the snake skin, the sun, you see the naga from the front, and then the vadra here with the never ending knot. And on this case, you've got different gods but with suns and stars and moons all the way around so very very beautiful so sometimes when people are healing 
they'll actually play the drum so the, the person being healed will sit here and the shaman will then drum sometimes with mantra as well so the mantra will go through the drum into the person amplified There's a form of diagnosis where the shaman will also listen to the tonality of the drum. Actually very similar to something that you can do with singing bowls, where, where the sound therapist moves, plays the bowl and moves it over the person and listens to the tone, how the tone gets absorbed by the body and how it changes. And I've seen shaman in, in Nepal do something very similar, where they're listening to the, to the tonality, they're listening to the way the sound gets absorbed by the body and then they're responding to that. So and then equally you can do this into a space, into the four directions, into the center. So there are other things that you can do which um, there are ways that you can play the drum that that produce other types of rhythmical effect. This isn't really the traditional way, but in the West, we, we have much more spontaneous, creative ways of approaching things because our, um, our orientation of the psyche is different, really, than in, in the East. So there's much more balance towards the individual. In the, in the, in, in the East, there's a lot more balance towards the group psyche and towards the sort of integrated archetypes. Um, in the West, those archetypes are, um, are much more differentiated individually. So, um, and then it's an active process to, to, uh, to integrate them. Whereas in, in the East, um, those archetypes are almost unconscious. And so, ironically, you've got a sort of, um, the, con the conscious mind is much less conscious, but the internal integration is much greater in the East. Um, when I've, after spending some, some years here, I noticed the incredible fragmentation of the Western consciousness. Um, but at the same time, you have these amazing benefits of, of uh, individuality and creativity and spontaneity and so on. So, there are other things that you can do with the drums, where, and this is, this is something I use in my own practice. I'll sometimes play the edges.
going to stop here because it's beginning to pull me into it. Um, you probably saw that my breath was beginning to pump with it. So <laughs> when you're so when you're when you're playing, one of the things I find that very, very helpful um, is actually allowing myself just to to feel my way into the drum, to feel my way into the the rhythm and allow myself to spontaneously flow. So you could probably see something was beginning to build up in me and I had to pull pull back there or, or I'd be gone. So the 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 rhythmical playing acts like an anchor to these altered states as well. So when you're when you're practicing a lot, when you're playing a lot, the moment you sit down and begin playing, you're you're in in that dynamic flow. You're in that altered state, and then you're travelling. So I was it, I, the energy was just beginning to pump through my belly, of the diaphragm, and fluctuate like this. And uh, because I have a cameraman here, and uh, maybe I'll do this another time, but. I wanted to still still be lucid to be able to talk to camera, so I, th I thought I'd better pull out. But the energy of the the energy of the drum is also like um, like a spiritual friend. So they think of the drum itself as as having its own living spirit inside the drum, and um, and and so they look after it in an in an in an appropriate way, like like having a a, a spirit friend that's, that that lives with you. The same actually for the fervor. They think of the fervor as containing its own life force, its own independent spirit. And my experience with these is that um, I particularly like using ancient objects because of the energy and the wisdom that's been in them. Um, sometimes I'll use new new shamanic objects or I'll make things myself. Um, but if you're if you're using a fervor that's maybe a hundred years old or a few hundred years old, it's been or a drum that's a few hundred years old, it's been used by many, many generations of shaman, maybe passed down through a um, you know, from father to son or from mother to daughter. And you have all those thousands and thousands of hours of energy transmitted into the drum. And they do all sorts of rituals as well to empower them, to, um, to, to give energy into it. And also to bring the spirit alive. They call the spirit to come and uh, animate the drum um, so, and, and the, the fervor and even before taking the wood for carving something they'll do all sorts of um, rituals related to the to the, the wood and the tree and the spirit of the um, of each of the elements which is which are contained in in the drum or in the or in the fervor or in the other magical objects um, so I have uh, a number of drums in England which I practice with. Um, my, my main instruments are there at the moment. So I have a number of other instruments that I use in, in Nepal. Um, and you build up this tremendous relationship with, with them. They have their own energy and their own spirit. And sometimes they Sometimes you can be using a, an ancient drum for many years and, and suddenly you're in the right frame of consciousness and it will reveal something extra to you, something that you didn't know. So one, one of the really interesting things about using uh, traditional old instruments and old, old ritual objects is that they've already got all this wisdom and knowledge and power inside them. Oh, the, there's a process of energy transmission that has happened through many, many years of practice and use. And um, 
actually one of the, the points at which I, I got really interested in, in the shamanic objects was I'd been practicing Tai Chi and Qigong for many years and I found that when I picked up the, the real powerful objects my hands always got hot and sometimes I got visions from the, from the objects um, sometimes like looking through the eyes of, of another shaman um, sometimes landscapes and, and places that these things had lived in and been in um, sometimes the knowledge how to do something so that that was actually the origin of me really beginning to to, to collect and uh, and to pass on magical objects because I, I I just felt that you know inside every fervor is like a whole library of information and the same with the, the ancient drums and, and other other instruments so I hope you found that interesting and uh, I'll be making other videos about the drums and other ritual objects um, you might want to have a look at the uh, video that I made on the symbolism of the fervor and um, I'll make another video about the, um, the, the separate symbolism for the different parts of the, the drum as well. So do let me know if there's anything particular that you're interested in. Give me feedback and do sign up to the, um, to the YouTube channel. Thank you.